what constitutes a culture that respects rule of law or what is the foundation of rule of law welcome vanakkam suprabhada beginning from today the budget session of the 18th lok sabha gets underway obviously this is a very important session even though uh, the legislative business will be superseded by the budgetary exercise it is still opportune for us to undertake a brief reflection on what law making is and how it connects to creating a culture which respects rule of law all of us agree and it is universally agreed that respect for rule of law is fundamental to the health of a democracy you can't have a democratic way of life where respect for the rule of law is not obtained if might is right then democracy is a non starter it's as simple as that so how do we create a culture that respects rule of law how do we ensure that uh, the proclivity on the part of the powerful the elite who th- throughout human history claimed for themselves in varying degrees the right to be above the law of the land as a matter of fact power is displayed the effect of power is proved by defying the law rather than complying with it so you see that the, the culture the elite culture in every society includes to a certain extent defiance to the rule of law now parliamentarians are respected for being law makers the laws they legislate the law the laws they make shape the life of citizens very substantially and therefore it is impossible to over exaggerate the importance and even the sanctity of the work they are called upon to do but increasingly it's a matter of concern for all of us who believes in the inevitability and desirability of democracy that the solemnity and the sense of serious purpose that but that must be attached to the sacred process of law making is being compromised and an element of boorishness is slowly creeping into it now in order to help us understand the importance of and the larger resonance of the law making responsibility let me only say this that in the early phase of the development of human civilization giving the law was always considered in all cultures in all societies a divine function uh the organized life of human beings began not with laws made by human beings but ostensibly and i say the word i say ostensibly very advisedly ostensibly with laws revealed or provided by god himself why was that so because in order to ensure that the authority of the law is uniformly accepted by the rich and the poor the powerful and the powerless the ruler and the ruled it was necessary to posit for law a source of authority which far transcended transcended the authority of any individual or institution take monarchy for example there are two possibilities one is that laws originated from the will of god or god dictated these laws as in the case of the 10 commandments in the bible the book of exodus which is the second book in the bible so those laws which are supposedly revealed by god himself are deemed inviolable they cannot be amended by any human authority 
It's impious and impertinent, rebellious to the will of God to try and amend laws enunciated and provided, or laws dictated, if you like, by God himself. And when uh, laws of that kind exist, no matter how powerful a monarch is, he feels obliged to abide by the law because the law did not originate in him or a political institution which is subordinate to him. It originated in God himself and therefore the authority of God far supervenes the authority of any human being, including the king, the mightiest of all emperors. And therefore the authority of divine law is always secure against uh, the changing and chopping effected by human beings to suit especially the interests of the economic, social, political elite. As Tolstoy very convincingly argues, in every society, laws are enunciated by the elite for the sake of the elite, though the canard is propagated that laws are enunciated for the sake of the common man. And he argues and argues very convincingly that there are very few instances, if at all, of laws being made for the sake of the common man, especially the poor and the marginalized. <clears throat> so, the question of the authority. Now, when in a secular age, the idea that laws can be dictated by God or laws can be uh, provided or prescribed by God, is frowned upon, is ridiculed, then we are left only with human beings as, as lawmakers. Now, what this means is that the source of the authority of the law applicable comes down by several notches from God to human beings, from heaven to earth. And therefore, the problem of respecting the ultimate authority of law, subjecting the most powerful officers in the country to the binding effect of law becomes more and more problematic. When laws were uh, uh, deemed to be revealed by God or provided by God, this problem did not exist, or if at all it existed, it existed in a very negligible, marginal fashion. But when the time comes, as in a secular age post-enlightenment, where rules are formulated by man and man alone, then the question as to who all should come under the authority of law and who should be de facto above or beyond the authority of law becomes extremely important. So this is one issue. But the issue that I want to flag even more, especially in light of how the 17th parliament functioned and how legislation was hustled through the parliament, is as follows. I appeal to all parliamentarians, irrespective of the distinction between treasury benches and the opposition benches, I appeal to all parliamentarians, the 543 of them, to take their legislative business more seriously. If through the televised spectacles of the proceedings that happen in the parliament, in which lawmakers apparently uh, formulate or draft laws and pass them without due democratic discussion, debate, with the freedom to examine all aspects of it in an attitude that's free from fear or favor. If lawmaking is undertaken within a framework of wrangling, uh, stronger measures, suppression of the voice of the opposition, suspension of large numbers of uh, opposition members of parliament who uh, want to resist what they consider to be unlawful legislations, then what happens is to the extent that this is being televised and citizens of the country from one end to the other are eyewitnesses to this. The net result is that whatever residual respect that existed in the mind of Indian citizens about law gets seriously compromised. After all, when they see that lawmakers are conducting themselves in a manner that's really repugnant and that they do not attach on their part any significance or sanctity to the responsibility of making laws, then correspondingly it cannot but happen that citizens of the country lose 
or modify, if you like, their attitude to law. After all, if the process by which a law is formulated and then enunciated is faulty, is less than dignified, and if it dispenses with the aura of dignity, solemnity, sanctity, then why would the common man take that law seriously? If the lawmakers themselves do not attach any dignity, seriousness and sanctity to what they do, why should citizens take or why should citizens attach authority and sanctity to the products of their wrangling and their uh, uncivil behavior, their uh, confrontationist, obstructionist, strong arm measures, I'm mixing up both sides. Now, the, I, I, I'm surprised that uh, this particular problem is not being paid attention to. And I appeal to all members of parliament to take this aspect seriously if they set any value by Indian democracy at all. They are knowingly or unknowingly ruining the citizens' respect for the rule of law. And uh, that actually endangers not only the health but even the survival of democracy as nothing else. It actually serves the interest of the man who occupies the highest office in the land to undermine the authority of law because then he can, without any compunction, presume himself to be above the reach of law. That is how democracy de degenerates into, uh, into, uh, in, into dictatorship. Even when that happens, it's not merely the person who succumbs to that delusion that is to blame, but everyone who participated in this diabolic process of undermining the sanctity of legislation and uh, spread abroad, spread among the people, disrespect, even contempt for the rule of law. Now, it's a very serious issue, and I can't exaggerate the importance of this issue. Fortunately, I don't have to because I can entrust this to my viewers who are mature and informed enough to take this reflection forward on their part. So there's one issue that I want to flag. The second issue, we are actually on the subject of creating a culture that is conducive to the rule of law. Now, let's say also realize that before the rule of law came, came into force, matters were decided on the basis of strength. So, we have the aphorism, might is right. So, the net result of that attitude to life or that social political arrangement was that the powerful always had their way and the powerless always deemed themselves excluded from the ambit of justice. They were not entitled to getting justice. So, affirming the rule of law is of particular importance to the common man, especially the poor and the downtrodden, whereas the ruling elite need not be committed to it because their interest is not affected by the degeneration of the culture of rule of law. This has to be understood very clearly. Now, let's take this a step further and ask, what happens to the laws passed by the parliament? The parliament only has a legislative function, which means that their work is limited only to drafting and passing, in other words, legislating laws. They have no implementary function. That is left to the state, the executive on the one part, and the judiciary on the other. The executive is meant to give effect to the law passed by the parliament, and the judiciary is supposed to overlook whether or not these laws are infringed in practice, either by the state or by fellow citizens. These are textbook things. I don't have to go into details. I only will mention and move on uh, in order to uh, economize on time. Now, suppose you have a parliament that's very efficient and it enunciates the best set of rules in the world, but you don't have an adequately or correspondingly efficient, responsible and uh, um, uh, people-friendly justice delivery system as well as law enforcement. Law, law enforcement agencies, which is maintained by the state, and then the judiciary, which is in theory autonomous, not under the authority of uh, the executive, the executive. So together, uh, we, we uh, refer to as the total justice delivery system. 
you can enunciate the best laws in the world, but if the justice delivery system is faulty, faulty, and if the whole process is weighted in favor of the rich and the powerful, then it makes a mockery of the rule of law. So actually, the, uh, the democratic concern as regards rule of law should, not, should go far beyond the dignity of legislative procedures to how the laws formulated pass, passed by the parliament, signed into law by the president of India, is implemented. And India is notorious for its track record in implementation. It's a big subject in itself. And if I go into the nuts and bolts issues of it, I'll uh, lose uh, track of time altogether, which I want to avoid. So a lot remains to be done by way of making a justice delivery system uh, to a certain extent, at least people-centric, people-friendly, whereas though it is not a politically correct thing to say, I must still say it, uh, as of now, it is uh, slanted heavily in favor of the powerful, in favor of the ruling elite, the economic elite, the social elite. If you are a poor man and you happen to be pitted against a powerful person, whether in politics or economics or social hierarchy, then the chances are that you have to be extraordinarily lucky to be able to get justice under the present scheme of things. Uh, I don't have to say anything more about that, I hope. <clears throat> now, there is a third dimension, third aspect, which we need to be extremely mindful of. These things are not mentioned in public. That's the reason why I'm sharing it with all of you. These are issues that the media should be talking about all the time. If at all they have any sense of democratic responsibilities, but to the extent that media has now been completely bought over by the corporate captains. It has become a captive maiden to corporate interest. It is far-fetched to expect this of the media, and that's why through the social media, uh, isolated voices like mine feel obliged to articulate these concerns and these insights with the citizens of India. Actually, what we are undertaking together is what might uh, what can be duly called citizenship education, continuing citizenship education. And therefore, I plead with all of you to share videos of this kind, whether they are produced by me or somebody else, it doesn't matter. The source doesn't matter, but the effect matters. So whenever you come across videos with contents like this, please share it as widely as you can, because ideas need to be disseminated. As Gandhiji realized, and as all sane thinkers before him did, that the external realities will change only if there's an internal change in the mind of the people. Thinking has to change before ground realities change. So we are in the business of impacting and influencing change so that we serve as change agents in relation to the thought process. Now, when we look into the past, we find two or three important ingredients that determine respect for the rule of law at the popular level. Now, I'm thinking entirely of the common man. And in terms of past history, down to our times. It's a huge expanse of time, so I have to be necessarily very, very brief, very snatchy, very jerky, and not offer a continuous commentary of how things evolved over time, spread over 5,000 years. So, and if I have to do it in five, seven, eight minutes, you can imagine how much grounds I can cover. <clears throat> uh, now, let's look at the brief landmark ideas here. As I have already mentioned, respect to the rule of law was created and sustained in traditional societies. All societies were traditional at some point. So in the traditional phase of all societies, respect for the rule of law was created and sustained by invoking the divine authority for law. Now, as I said, we are not living in the age of faith. We are living in the age of skepticism. We are in the post-modern age of post-truth politics. So you can imagine that the authority of God doesn't count at all here. And that's why it's possible for even politicians to claim that they are gods. This could not have been done in the age of faith. For anybody to claim that he or she is God, the age of faith has to be left far behind. Uh, that's actually an anomaly. It's, a, uh, it's, a, it's an oxymoron. It's a contradiction. Uh, a truth that appears in the 
shape or the garb of a contradiction is an oxymoron. So that is now out. So we can't claim the divine uh, sanction for a set of rules in order to persuade a people to abide by the authority of their law. That's out of the question. In the past also, authority for law was secured, reinforced, preserved by claiming ancestral authority. Say in patriarchal cultures, that's by and large the arrangement. The patriarchs used to be the lawgivers and whatever they said was the law. And many of the patriarchs, as in the case of the Old Testament, claimed that they were in direct communion with God and therefore God revealed these things to them and therefore these laws must apply forever. And no one dared to question it and they, these laws remained the same forever. Until of course in much, much later times, a completely different paradigm of religion or paradigm of religion, a spiritual vision came about superseding the patriarchal uh, uh, system of laws, etc. Uh, as in the case of Jesus who gives an, a new commandment. And that takes a lot of guts. You can't go on giving new commandments especially superseding the commandments which the Jews believed were given by God himself. Now that is so, I have so far mentioned two important sources of authority for law that helped to preserve respect for rule of law. One was the idea that God, uh, the laws were given by gods. In all cultures you find this idea. There is no culture which is uh, free from this, this, this hypothesis or this assumption or this dogmatic belief, which is perhaps more accurate way of putting it. Second is the idea that these laws had ancestral sanctions and we are nobody to modify them and we can't get ahead of our ancestors and we venerate them, we look up to them, they're godlike to us and therefore that's the end of it. For example, Abraham as an ancestor carried the sort of weight, uh, weight of authority that you can barely imagine. The third, uh, the third aspect of respect for the rule of law is Custom, custom. Well, this has been done in this manner for a long time. The English common law is largely made up of customs. It is not uh, part of the legislative procedure. But these common laws have played a huge role in sustaining the discipline and order, law, uh, uh, rule of law and order, social order and the political cohesion in the the context of the English society, British society. So the, the role that respect for the tradition, the particular tradition, or in the form of customs and practices, uh, that a people in their evolution through their own history have evolved over a long period of time. Therefore, these time-tested customs, traditions, practices, and the kind of authority they wielded over the people is simply enormous, enormous. And since they were all time tested and deeply lodged in the psyche, the, the common psyche of the people, the idea of defying them in order to prove one's superiority over others or one's show, show of one's personal power uh, was alien. In, uh, and there were rare exceptions to this, but by and large, people did not... Uh, fly in the face of time-tested, hallowed, honorable customs, traditions, norms, practices. I have so far mentioned three items. If you really take a quick view of it, you'll find that the age in which we are living today, the period in which we are living today, the post-enlightenment, the post-modern, the post-truth culture and politics, all three ideas have been seriously eroded. Why do I mention this? I mention this in order to drive home to all of us that we should not take respect for the rule of law for granted. Because all the traditional mainstays for the rule of law are gone. And the only thing that remains today is the authority of the parliament, the coercive power of the state, and the ad adjudicatory function of the judiciary particularly the Supreme Court of India. And therefore, as citizens, we must respect the authority of all three of them. I am particularly concerned that we have to be critical of the executive. I don't want to be because I know that being always 
critical of the executive can actually create or invite a culture of anarchy. The executive has its authority, it has its legitimate will, it has the authority, the power as well as the right to exercise power and if need be coercively to in, ensure that the society and the body politic does not degenerate into anarchy and chaos. So a certain amount of the legitimate use of coercive power goes with the very idea of the, of the executive. The legislative must be autonomous and sovereign in its own domain, so also the judiciary. But just as the citizens, as I said a short while ago, have a duty to respect the authority of these three major pillars of democracy, with the fourth being the fourth estate being the media. The men and women who animate these three plus one, including the media, uh, media, the four pillars of democracy, must respect the sanctity of the institutions that they belong to, they represent. I'm doubtful if that's happening at the moment. They are very keen that the common man should respect these institutions and the people belonging to them, but they don't seem to have a corresponding sense of urgency about respecting the work of the institutions to which they belong. Now, that's a very serious flaw. I think the first duty of a member of parliament is to respect the parliament. And I would go to the extent of saying that a member of parliament must respect the parliament above the party. That's the proof of patriotism. No member of parliament should lend himself to creating pieces of legislation or laws that are meant to disrupt a society, spread bad blood among the people, or to inflate the privileges of one section of the society to the detriment of the large sections of the remaining society, or to buttress and uh, legitimize uh, vested interests, or to make the authority of the executive larger than life, creating uh, or transforming a political person into a god or a demigod. All these are processes that insult the parliament and thereby insult oneself as a member of the parliament. So I would plead with all members of parliament, I couldn't care less whether they belong to the treasury benches or to the opposition parties, to respect the parliament about the party as a matter of, as an authentic expression of their patriotism. And in particular, I'll appeal to Sri Rahul Gandhi because he seems to be the most sensible of all politicians. From my point of view today, I could be wrong, but this on evidence, available to me today, he seems to be the most open to suggestions, to uh, responsible thinking and the willingness to correct oneself, improve oneself. That's the reason why I say repeatedly, he's the most improved politician in Indian uh, politics today. Therefore, it makes sense to appeal to him. But I don't want to be cynical about others. Therefore, I appeal to everyone to respect the parliament to which they belong. Now, if you remember, in 2014, when uh, Sri Narendra Modi was elected to the Indian parliament, the Lok Sabha for the first time, as he entered the parliament for the first time, he bent down and kissed the stepping stones to a parliament. That was a gesture that went home to all of us and it awakened a lot of expectations from us. But these token gestures are one thing. And how you conduct the business of the parliament and how you direct and cause this, this business to be transacted is a very different thing. I have to say as a dispassionate, objective observer that Modi's reverential gesture with which he began his stint with the parliament was not sustained into the way the parliamentary proceedings was, were conducted in the 16th and 17th Lok Sabha. And in the present instance, he began by kissing the constitution simply because the opposition parties made much of the ill-advised petulant, uh, rather stupid revelations by some members of the BJP, some responsible members of the BJP that the, uh, the party needed 400 seats to amend the constitution of India. And this, of course, 
caused the BJP tear and was the largest or the most strongest reason why the party fell below the 272 mark. And is Mr. Narendra Modi kissing the constitution of India in full public view in order to take the wind away from the sails of the India Alliance opposition? Or is he a converted man and he is sending a message to all parliamentarians and the citizens of India that he will now strictly adhere to the spirit and letter of the Indian constitution? We have to wait and see. We have to wait and see. And fortunately, we don't have to wait long to get an answer for it. So anyway, so uh, now I'm going to conclude our thinking on respect for the rule of law. I, ha I have to emphasize that democracy will be seriously endangered if rule of law is diluted or subverted. Secondly, respect to the rule of law should not be taken for granted. Number three, the traditional mainstays for supporting and sustaining respect for rule of law have all disappeared. Namely, the idea that gods dictated laws and therefore human beings cannot take them lightly. The third being, the idea that the, our ancestors took these laws seriously, they submitted themselves to the rule of law, and therefore these are time-tested in terms of their efficacy, their beneficial efficacy on, on the life of the people, and therefore we also need to, we, we also need to uh, uh, take them seriously and respect their authority over us. Third, uh, the respect for the ancient customs, practices, uh, norms, etc. Uh, all these things together create a climate of opinion within which the rule of law is considered inviolable. All that is now gone. And we are therefore left with only these four pillars of democracy, namely the parliament, the executive, the judiciary, and the fourth estate, which is the media. And if all members of, of these four important democratic institutions do not carry out their work, go about their business with a sense of democratic responsibility rather than a state of subservience to X, Y or Z, whether of the, uh, 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 of the state or of the corporate sector, then they are together creating an ambience in which the rule of law will lose its respect in the minds of the people with a terrible disservice done to the Indian democracy and I sincerely hope that it doesn't happen. And the only way we can ensure that it doesn't happen is by spreading this awareness as wide and strong as possible. This idea must be lodged clearly and firmly in the consciousness of every Indian so that there is an expectation created of the people who animate these four pillars of Indian democracy, forcing them in a kind of indirect and subtle manner to behave in a more responsible and democratic sort of way. That, that's where you and I can make a beneficial contribution to the building of India. And we are focused entirely on that business. We are not here to support or you know, uh, blow the trumpet of this uh, camp or that camp. We are citizens of India. India is, India is our home. And we shall do everything possible to ensure that our home is kept in order and it doesn't become a place where some members are suffocated and the other members think they have the license to behave in a boorish manner, uh, in a lumpenized fashion, but that India becomes a dignified place where the children of Mother India are free to enjoy themselves and celebrate the beauty and the greatness of life together so that we become a beacon of light to the global community. Jai Hind. One day, Madhra.